begin with a word of prayer? So I'll start. Ahem. 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 Right. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students. Just pray you be with us this afternoon. Just help us to understand what we can, again, about Calculus 3, about your creation. And we thank you, uh, Lord, for the privilege we have here just to speak openly about you. And we thank you, again, Lord, for your salvation that you freely offer to us if we just accept you into our hearts and repent from our sins. Lord, we thank you for the grace that, that you've given us, Lord. You know, I pray. Amen. All right. Um, so I hope I have convinced you that dot products and cross products are worth knowing. Right? We've seen that we can ca calculate the angle between vectors. That would be geometrically very challenging. We even find the area of triangles and three-dimensional space. It's kind of neat. Um, two other applications of cross products and dot products that I have not yet mentioned, uh, applications to physics. I'll just briefly mention track. Um, so the two ones that pop into my head right off the top is the work is equal to the force dot the displacement. So that gives you the work done by a force F over um, a displacement delta R. Now that's only true if the force is constant over displacement. Otherwise, this is some sort of gross, grossly incorrect quantity. I mean, so that's a special case. But anyway, if the force is constant, that gives you the work done. Um, another nice application, uh, kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the momentum dot the momentum um, divided by twice the mass. Or if you're offended by that expression, I could write it this way, 1 half mv dot v. There's a formula for the kinetic energy in terms of dot products. Dot products are important because they're invariant under rotations of coordinates. So they're, they're, they're likely to come up in physics. Cross products, then. Cross products in physics. I mean, there's more. I have a couple examples in the notes about the role that dot products plays in calculating the flux of a vector field through an area. Dot products select components, right? So if you want to pick out part of some field which is pointing a direction, well, the dot product is a good way to do that. It, it will pick out just the part which is pointing in a certain direction. So the, the idea of projections we talked about also can be used in physics in the calculation of something called flux. But we'll get to more of that later this semester. So let me get back to the other story. The other story, of course, is torque. The torque is the moment arm R cross the force. This um, gives you a measure of how uh, something is twisting as a consequence of an applied force, right? In physics, we learned that this also is giving you the time rate change of the angular velocity with respect to time. And you say, well, what's angular velocity? Well, I'm glad you asked. Angular velocity is also defined in terms of a cross product. It is, in fact, if I remember right, do I remember right? Huh. Well, I think it's R cross P, where P is the ordinary momentum. Um, or if you wanted me to write this in terms of mass and velocity, this is R cross MV, which is M R cross V. So anyway, the cross product comes up in the study of rotational physics all over the place. And oh, the other place the cross product comes up in physics, which is interesting, is in the so-called Lorentz force law, Q. Um, well, you have the electric force. But then you have the velocity cross the magnetic field. Um, so the cross product comes up in, in the study of electromagnetism as well. So anyway, dot product and cross product, also important to physics, which, by the way, is a lot of the reason you have to take this course, right? Because you have majors which involve physics in one sense or another, right? And or 3D visualization, so, which is, of course, why Calculus 3 is a required course for computer science majors, since most of you want to be gaming software programmers, except that it isn't a requirement. Err, it should be. <laughs> Sorry. Also, these biologists, for some reason, don't require Calculus 3. Err, that's so annoying. Anyway, any questions about this? Obviously, I don't really expect you to understand these deeply because you have two courses in that which are required of you here called Physics 1 and 2. I leave it to that. All right. So what are we talking about today? Lines and planes. All right. So we want to learn how can we talk about lines 
and planes in 3D, mostly in R3. Now, how did you describe a, a line in the plane? Y equals mx plus b, right? That's not going to work here because one equation doesn't, if you, if you said something like that, that wouldn't define a line. It would define a plane as we'll learn as we go on here. So we have to take a parametric approach, right? So a line is something that goes through two points, right? So if I, um, if I want, I can talk about a base point, let's say R0, and I can talk about a direction vector V, right? There's some sort of coordinate system. So to describe the line, I need to give a formula for R of t. So <coughs> this, this base point would correspond to what? So here, I'm, I'm sorry, I need to start using some other colors. Oh, I usually make that z. Sorry. <laughs> Two x's. <laughs> Dos keys. The most interesting graph in the world. Okay, sorry. That's, is that liberty approved? I don't know. Uh, maybe not. Um, so anyway. Um, So the, the, red, the red vector is just the position vector that points to a particular point on the line, right? As t varies, we trace out the line. So like back here, this would be what t equals to 0, right? t equals to 0 is, is what I'm is saying is when we're at this base point r not. Anyway, what's the formula? Let me get to it. So, and you can take this as a definition if you want. This is the vector definition of a line. r of t is equal to r not plus t times v. This is the vector parameterization of a line. With direction vector v and base point are not. Doesn't no, it doesn't have to have any particular length. I mean, if you think about t being time and this actually being the, the motion of a particle through space, that is the honest to goodness velocity. Which is a vector in three dimensions. But now I'm getting a little bit ahead of the story. Okay, so if you want to think about this line as a set of points in R3, you could describe it in terms of set builder notation as follows. It's R naught plus T V such that t is a real number. Okay, so if I, if I want to think about the line as actually a set of points in R3, there, there's how I would write it. Sometimes you might want to just refer to the line as a set of points independent of its parameterization. Remember we learned in Calculus 2, a single curve can have many different parameterizations, right? Let's look at some examples. R of t equals to 1 plus 2t, comma 3 plus 4t, comma 5 plus 6t. Is this a line? What's its base point? What's its direction vector? You're like, um, so you just do 1, 3, 5, plus pull out the t. Um, two, four, six. That's just by the vector addition we learned earlier this week, right? Group all the things with t together. Group all the things without t. The things without t are the base point. The things that multiply the t, that's the direction vector. So this is, this is the direction vector. This is the base point.
Are there other ways to parameterize this line? Let me show you a stupid way. How about R2 of t? I only use a different variable. Say R2 of lambda equals to, let's see here, how about 1, 3, 5 plus t times the sine of t, 2, 4, 6. We sort of try to visualize in our mind's eye what this thing looks like. So 1, 3, 5 is some point out here like that, basically, right? And this line then looks something give or take like this, right? And so you just kind of travel that way as t goes to infinity. If the direction vector looks like this, I'm just sort of trying to imagine it without getting bogged down in the details of actually figuring out which direction is which and so forth, okay? Schematically speaking, it's something like that. If you think about it in terms of physical motion of a particle, it's just got constant velocity, just kind of do 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 off and on, on and on and on and on. This parameterization, on the other hand, same point set, right? So you could either write L as R of t, such that t is in reals. That is also equal to the point set R2 of t, such that t is in the reals. I mean, it's the same set of points in R3, but the parameterization in the second case is radically different, right? If I can put it on the same picture, what would it look like? Oh, man, don't try to do that. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> These Yes, okay. See, where's a marker I don't care about? I think this one's 30 by. So the second parameterization starts at the same place, zero, right? What happens with sine t? What's the graph of t sine t? Here's t, here's minus t, sine t does this. So what this formula does is this. <laughs> it traces out the same line infinitely many times, going faster and faster, always crossing back through the base point every so often. Same point set, radically different parameterization, right? So if I ask you to parameterize a line, I probably want this one, but if you wanted to be a jerk, you could give me this one. I mean, <laughs> but then again, the joke's on you if I actually, try, if I actually asked you to calculate something. Trust me, you'd rather calculate with this than this, right? Okay. Anyway, I, I, I'm in reruns right now. You learn this in calculus too. A curve has many parameterizations. If you didn't learn about parameterized curves in calculus too, you were cheated. And you should demand a refund. What's that? I was cheated. That's true, yes. Um, but on the other hand, my Calculus two instructor was great. His name was Dr. Lang. He worked for NASA before it was NASA. He's great. He's hilarious. Um, we ended class three weeks early. He's like, um, well, I'll see you at the final. It's like, what? <laughs> it was good, though. <laughs> I should follow his footsteps. Well, that, with that, let's get to work. All right, so <coughs> find line from P equals to 1, 2, 3 to Q equals to 7, 7, 7 with base point. <laughs> base point 666. I'm not sure that would form a line. <laughs> let's, I mean, let's use the base point P, okay? There is a standard trick I'm going to show you, all right? Pay attention. You can use this. So what you do is you do R of t. You just put p. That's where you want it to start. So that's what I want to start with. And then I do plus t, all right, times q minus p. 
And if you just think about this, what happens when you put t equals to 0? So r of 0 is p, right? What's r of 1? It's q. And again, we don't, we don't care what the, the magnitude of the v vector is, so it, this is fine. If you cared about the magnitude of the v, which we call the speed in physics, th then we'd have to be more, this, this formula would need some, some, some tinkering. But that works. I mean, it takes time one. This is a standard, it's a go-to formula. Basically, it takes one unit of time to get from p to q if we use this. But it's, it's so simple to remember, right? I mean, once you see it and you recognize its awesomeness, you can put this in your stack of things to know and then you won't have to um, think so hard about how to write the formula. So what is the formula then? For us here it's 1, 2, 3 plus t times, um, let's see here, 7 minus 1 is 6. Sorry, it's not going to work out. 5. Hey, wait a minute, why are you guys rooting for 666? Let's see here, 4. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not the Liberty way. Let's see here. <laughs> so there you go. That is the vector parameterization of this line. Simple as that. What if you wanted to make the base point the midpoint? What would you do then? How do you find the midpoint? Right, and so if you average each component of each point, and you do it on each component, then what you're really doing is just averaging the vectors. So what you do is p plus q over 2. So I, I agree with you, and I raise you a lazier formula, which is this. That's the midpoint between p and q. And so the midpoint, in this case, is oh, still not 666, six, six, sorry. Um, it is 8, 9, 10 divided by 2, or if you like, 4, 4.5, 5. I know you guys like decimals. You miss them. There's one. Um, so then R2 of t would be 4, 4.5, 5, plus t times same direction vector, which was 6, 5, 4. Okay. So there's how you could set up the parameterization based on the midpoint. Again, there are many, many parameterizations for a line. Yes, sir? Exactly. Yep. Oh, well, it depends on the orientation of the line. I haven't really talked about that, and, but you, you see there's, there's two different ways. I mean, okay, are we talking about disoriented lines or oriented lines? A li an oriented line is one with a sense of direction. So if there's a sense of direction, then I have to insist on the V is going in a certain direction, as is specified by the details of the problem. So if I was to do that, I wouldn't quite agree with you. I would keep this the same, but, well, uh, I would basically just keep this the same and just put Q here. Um, I, don't, I, have, I have to think of, it depends on how the problem stated. At this point, I forgot what we're doing. So. Hmm. The plane. Sorry, that was horrible. Um, <coughs> so we should talk about planes. Those give you guys more trouble. Don't worry, lines will always be with us. What is a plane? A two-dimensional space. A two space. I mostly agree with you. Yeah, I mean they're, they're definitely a two-dimensional space, but I think that alone doesn't quite pin it down because I also think of a sphere as being two-dimensional or, or like a bowl as being two-dimensional, but certainly it's a two-dimensional space, yeah. So, but it's flat. That's what makes up, I mean, the plane is a, is a flat two-dimensional space, right? Whatever flat means, I'm throwing some words around like they mean something. Dimension, what's dimension? 
something you guys agree to, but we've never defined. And yet you know what I mean when I talk about dimension. And I'll just leave it at that for now. If you want a careful definition of dimension, come talk to me sometime after class. All right, so basically, if this is a plane, it's got some, some vector, right? Which is what? <coughs> which is not on the plane, right? There's a vector which is perpendicular to the plane. And that vector is what we call the normal. All right. And so typically the normal we'll use A, B, C for. That's just kind of our go-to notation. But let me illustrate it with a uh, prop I bought today. Okay. Um, so, so, sorry. Don't need to be. Look what I brought into the, this. All right. So here, here's your normal. See that? It doesn't matter if I tur tilt the plane in space or whatever. The point is the normal is the same. It's parallel translated no matter where you are in the plane. Whether it's like this, yeah, if I could hold my both hands straight. So the point is the normal is the same vector no matter where you put the point of application for the vector, right? That, that's part of what makes it a plane. Now, what makes this vector the normal? How can we state this geometric idea in terms of vector calculus? Not calculus, vector algebra. How about this? So first of all, I'm thinking about a base point for the plane. Let's suppose that this is at R naught. I mean, why not? So that's the base point for the plane, a particular point on the plane. And so what I'd like to do is describe a condition for an arbitrary point on the plane, let's say x, y, z. Right? And so to that point, there's another position vector from the origin, which you can envision. Let's call it R. Okay. Those probably should be dotted because I'm envisioning them being below the plane, but oh, fine, I'll dot them. It's not as awesome as that one professor on the YouTube. Have you guys seen it? He works on chalkboard, though. I'll never be able to do it here. It's part of my sadness. But he's, he's mastered this art of drawing dotted lines just by like skidding the chalk along the board. It's truly awesome. Some of you have seen it. No? Yeah, you've seen it. It's amazing. He, he draws dotted lines like this. Like zzz, zzz. There's, there's like a compilation of it. You can find it. It's, it's pretty awesome. Hmm. Bat Dad or that guy? I don't know. That guy? I think that guy, yeah. I mean, Bat Dad is more of a, well, anyway. Let me stop talking about Bat Dad. OK, so the vector which connects those two points, I would call the displacement vector. This vector is tangent to the plane, so I want to think about this guy right here. See that? Let's call that delta r, just to give it a name. So you see r naught plus delta r should be equal to what? r, right? But more, more to the point, delta r, which I don't really care about, it's equal to r minus r naught. Yes, tangent to the plane means lies in the plane. That's a very good question. Points to the plane does not mean lies in the plane. Points to the pl when I say points to the plane, I mean it's anchored at the origin, and the, the head of the vector is just touching the plane. Okay. So a vector which points to the plane corresponds to a point which is actually part of the plane as a point set. Ah, oh, that reminds me. I want to make sure I, oh, has this already come back to me? No, I don't think I did. Let me make sure I've counted you all. OK, so what made the normal vector the normal vector? It's perpendicular to what? Yeah, every tangent vector in the plane, right? So in particular, we have to have this equation, n dot delta r, right? has to be equal to 0. That, that essentially is the geometric meaning of the normal vector. But this gives us the vector equation for the plane. See, because what we have is we have n dot, what's delta r, by the way? If you work out it, it's, its formula. So I guess I should tell you, we should, we should come up with some components, perhaps. 
Well, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm one thing at a time here. I, I will put the components down, but I, there's, there's two equations I'm after here, and I, I, I need to do one, and then I'll do the other. So first of all, the vector equation. It's n dot r minus r naught equals to 0. That defines the plane. Basically, r um, satisfying this lies, or not lies, points. Um, now, what's the word? I guess I'd just like to say that r is an element of the plane P if it satisfies this condition. I mean, the set of points corresponding to these vectors are x, y, z is actually a point in the plane, right? If it satisfies that equation. <coughs> now, in detail, what's that look like? That, that this is the so-called vector parametric, vector, um, I forget the words. It's a vector equation. Thing. Now, if I do a, b, c, right, and I dot with, OK, so what is r minus r naught? If r naught has coordinates x naught, y naught, z naught, then r minus r naught is x minus x naught, y minus y naught, z minus z naught, right? And so this dot product being equal to 0, that, that's the condition I need for a point x, y, z to be in the plane. So you work out that dot product. What do you get? a times x minus x naught plus b times y minus y naught plus c times z minus z naught is equal to 0. This is the uh, scalar, scalar equation for plane P with normal ABC and base point x naught, y naught, z naught. <laughs> of course, I could be pointless and just write it like this. Here's a pointless equation of the plane. That's not standard terminology, but I think it serves the purpose. The reason I say it's a pointless equation for the plane is you can't just read a point on the plane off from the equation itself. By the way, I mean, like this, the equation for the line we were looking at before, right? If you just look at it, you can immediately, by inspection, see a point on the line. You can see that the point 135 was on that line. It's immediately obvious, right? I really got to get a clock for in here. When do we start? So I have till 5, huh? 30 minutes. Yeah, time flies when you're having fun, I guess. Let's see here. I, I speak for myself. Um, OK, so for example, hey, you guys like numbers, right? How about this? Um, 3 times x plus 2 minus 4 times oops, y minus 7 plus 6 times z minus pi. There. So what is this? If you look at the collection of all x, y, z in R3, which satisfy this equation, in other words, the locus of points which satisfies this equation, what is it? Well, we know from what we just did, it's a plane by looking at it. But which plane is it? What's the normal to the plane? What's a point on the plane just by inspection of the equation? Can you see it? I'll start out with the normal. What's the normal? You, I, I got 3, negative 4, 6, 
right, at the normal. What's its base point? Minus 2, 7, and pi. Yeah. Exactly. Now, of course, the choice of base point is not unique, right? For that matter, the choice of normal is not unique, right? You could write the equation for a plane a lot of different ways. Let me show you why I mean pointless equation. Suppose I had um, minus x plus 2y plus 3z equals 22. You can immediately tell me what the normal is to the plane. What is it? What do I got? Negative 1, negative 1, 2, and 3. Now, if, if, if for some reason you didn't hear what I was saying about the normal, if you're not getting this yet, <coughs> don't fear. You have not much that you're missing. Once you see what it is that you're missing, when you do, if you didn't understand how he saw that, don't worry. It's something you can fix very easily, but we're going to go on, OK? <laughs> the identification of the normal is just as simple as identifying coefficients of x, y, and z, right? What's the point on the plane? The what? Variable equal. I need what, what? Give me a specific point on this plane. There are infinitely many. Surely you can find one. Um, what's that? Negative one, zero, seven. Negative one, zero, seven. Let's see. Is the gentleman correct? Minus a uh, minus one, plus two times zero, plus three times seven, is in fact equal to one plus twenty-one, which is equal to twenty-two. We have a winner. Yes, indeed, that point, when you plug it into the equation of the plane, works. Therefore, the point is on the plane. How did you find that? Uh huh. So you like, basically, you're like, I like 21, but 21 isn't quite 22, so. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, that's like a totally legitimate way. Um, here is, here is, here's a lazy man's way. You put two of the variables equal to 0. y equals z equals 0. That implies x is equal to minus 22. So another point on the plane is minus 22, 0, 0. In other words, there are really simple points to find on most planes. I mean, there are exceptions to this. But if you look at, there's going to be some point where it intersects like the xz plane. There's going to be some really easy point where it intersects the xy plane. There's going to be some really easy point where it intersects the zy plane. Those coordinate planes, what, what is the equation of the coordinate plane? <coughs> we should talk about that. Coordinate planes. So let, let's start out with the, the xy plane. Yeah, what's the equation of this? You said, you said z equals to 0. That is correct. This is the equation of the xy plane. Now, if you're unsettled by how he guessed the point, you should be. Not because he's wrong, but because there's a choice we have to make. A lot of times in a lot of problems, sometimes you've got to make a choice. You've got to find a point on the object. How do you do that? Sometimes in here, you just have to set something equal to 0, and then you can find a point. There's literally an aspect to a lot of problems in here which just involves making a guess. That's unsettling to you guys because you're, you're not used to having such freedom, right? And with that freedom comes responsibility. That is true. But how about this? I guess this is ambiguous until I put y, x, z, 
this, this yz plane, what's its formula? Right. And I think you see where we're going. The xz plane is what? y equals 1, right? No, sorry. <laughs> but what would y equals 1 be? It would be a parallel plane, right? It would be like, it would be over here like that. How do you judge whether two planes are parallel? How do you judge whether two lines are parallel? What do you use? For planes, you use the normal. Do they have parallel normals? We already know how to check parallel normals, right? We learned if the dot product, if the angle between them is zero, right? Or you could say the cross product between the normals is zero. Um, we, we, do ca we don't care. It c actually, technically speaking, the normals could be parallel or anti-parallel. So technically, parallel, the collinear is probably a better term to use. I sometimes forget to qualify that, right? Any plane, really, if you think about it, which side is up? I mean, it's just a choice. I mean, you, you think I'm standing right side up, but that's just your convention. Maybe I'm standing upside down. It's just a question of how you measure the z. <laughs> anyway, there's kind of a, gravity is very orienting, right? Yeah. I just think that the, the normals don't do the same thing as the normals. Right. In fact, any vector along the so-called normal line would work. So two planes are parallel if they have parallel normals, or collinear normals, and two lines are parallel if they have, um, you know, direction vectors which are collinear. Or if you're thinking about oriented lines, maybe they have to point in the same direction. They actually have to be parallel. Um, that would depend on the kind of word problem you're thinking about. But are we good? So what I was finding, what I found here is actually the intersection point, right, of that plane and the what? What's x equals? This isn't just one equation. Actually, I was even greedier. I have x equals, I have z equals 0 and y equals 0. What is this actually? Which was, this is what? Where is, where is y equals to 0? And z equals to 0. It, yes, it's the x-axis. This is the x-axis. So actually, by the way, this is an indication of how, how you know, there's a natural question to ask here. You, you guys maybe not have noticed that noticed this yet, but if, you, if you're paying attention to the, to the story we told today, <coughs> I started in the world of parametrized things when I told you about lines, because it was convenient to our purposes to describe lines parametrically, right? I didn't need two parameters. Now, I'm talking about planes, and I'm not talking about parameterization anymore. I'm talking about describing the plane by a Cartesian equation. Right? Because that's convenient. What would, how do you describe a line by equations? A line is one dimensional, right? So if you start with three dimensions, basically you need two equations to fix a line because you have to reduce two degrees of freedom. Here are two equations that give you back a line, the x-axis. Now we could also parameterize these planes in terms of two parameters, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Let me show you that. <coughs> so those are kind of the four things we need to think about in terms of what's, what's out there to understand. You just draw a picture. Uh, it's sort of a, um, our to-do list. Lines. Planes. Um, parametric, um, implicit, aka Cartesian equation. So at the moment, we discovered this here. I'll draw it like this. We have filled in two of these boxes at the moment. Parametrized form of a line, of course, is just R of t equals to R naught plus
plus TV. We learned about that. Plane, we haven't talked about the parametric version of the plane yet, but we did talk about its Cartesian form. It was this. Now, as we go on, both parametric and Cartesian formulations of objects have their place in this course. They're both important. We can't neglect either. We must understand both. So. So I started this discussion by showing you the most natural, in my view, way to understand lines and planes. And they're, they're dual because it takes one parameter to describe a line and it takes one equation to describe a plane. But those are really descriptions of exactly the opposite type. Right? How, so what, what are the Cartesian equations of a line? How would you find those? Let's go back to that now. I'll show you with an example, all right? So let's suppose we have parameterization, R of t, 1, 2, 3, um, plus t times 4, 5, 6. I want to now find, I want to describe this in terms of Cartesian coordinates instead of describing it parametrically, all right? So how do you, I mean, how do you do that from just kind of, you know, uh, here's, here's a, a very elementary way to think about it. Okay, so what I really have is I've got 1 plus 4t, right? I've got 2 plus 5t. I've got 3 plus 6t. And I, I want to discover the Cartesian equation for this plane, right? So I want to think about this as being, the first thing is what? It's x, right? This is y. This is z. So I've got three equations to work with, right? And there's one thing, there's one guy we're not, that's not you know, he comes to the party, we're going to be like, nope, you're not allowed. You're not welcome here. What's his name? His name is T. That's right. It does sound kind of, I mean, do you have any friends named T? It does seem kind of, kind of sound like kind of a little bit sketchy. Mr. Mr. T? <laughs> Pity the line. Sorry. All right. So solve for t. t is equal to what? t is equal to x minus 1 over 4. Solve for t here. t is equal to y minus 2 over 5. Solve for t here. t is equal to, what is this? <coughs> z minus 3 divided by 6. And so we have found the beloved well, I don't know if they're beloved, but they're equations um, for the line. And for reasons of tradition, we write them as a single equation. But if you really look at it, they're two equations. So this is the so-called symmetric equations for the line. Do you see what the <laughs> denominator's significance is? Slope, slope, yeah, we'd like to say slope, but slope doesn't make sense. In, I mean, the generalization of the slope. In three dimensions, the slope is a vector. This is the generalized slope. I mean, that's not a wrong idea, right? One number won't do it. We need a direction vector. But that's the next best thing to slope in three dimensions. So I, I, I totally agree with that, what you said. But exact, so four, five, six. And what's the significance of the one, two, three? That's the base point for the line, right? So these are the symmetric equations for a line. Generically speaking, x minus x naught over a equals to y minus y naught <coughs> over b z minus z naught over c. These are the symmetric equations for a generic line. But there's some fine print here. What do we need to know about a, b, and c? Right. So I don't really like this formalism because it's, it's very limiting. 
It doesn't even get important examples like this. Here's the analog of symmetric equations for the x-axis, which is certainly a line, but is by no means covered by the standard symmetric equations. So to me, the description of a line in terms of its symmetric equations is very awkward. But there it is, and it's important to recognize that, right? Because if you think about this, any time we have two planes and we ask what's the intersection of two planes, well, when you do that, you're going to find a line a lot of times, right? And in fact, that, that is exactly the same thing. It's a symmetric equation, symmetric equations for the line if you think about, you know, looking for where two planes are coinciding. Each, each one of these is a, is a plane, right? So, it, yeah, well, I'll show you. so there's that. Um, I'm just going to write it symmetric equations, okay? And uh, honestly, besides the thing I just told you, understanding that the intersection of two planes is a line, I don't really use symmetric equations for a line too much, as far as I know. On the other hand, the parameterization of a plane is something we will need to use later on, so it's important to understand a little bit more. Um, so let's, let's do that. So how do we, how do we describe a plane parametrically? Now, you, are, you already told me that the plane is two-dimensional. And if you wanted me to give you a heuristic definition of what dimension is, it's how many independent parameters you need to describe the object. A 10-dimensional uh, object needs 10 independent parameters. A plane is two-dimensional. It needs two independent parameters. So, you know, um, here's a picture, roughly speaking. And if I've got some base point, say R0, and if I have two vectors which lie in the plane, tangent vectors, okay? If I have, say, um, A, and suppose I also have another vector, uh, B, and th these are these A and B lie in the plane. They're tangent to the plane. which is to say that they're perpendicular to the normal. Then I can, I can think about, okay, so you, you think about this, picture a point in the plane here. How do I get there? I can start at the base point, right? And I can travel along the direction of one of my tangent vectors until I get to here. And then I can travel along the direction of the other tangent vector until I get to there. Just geometrically, that has to be that, that has to happen. So this this piece down here would be something like s times a because you need so many copies of the a vector, okay. And then the the other piece would you could say is is t times b. And there you have it. If this is an arbitrary point in the plane we're trying to parameterize, r of, say, s comma t, what is it going to be? It's going to be equal to r naught, the base point, plus s times a, plus t times b. And so there you have it. That's a generic um, way to parameterize a plane. That's not my only go-to formula. There's another thing that's nice for the plane, um, parametrically speaking. Uh, this is another thing that I try to share with students early on. So let me do it before I get into numerical examples. Um, we'll, we'll do both. I'll tell you what, let me do a numerical example before I get, let me behave. I'll, I'll do the numerical example first. There, there's something else I need to tell you, but uh, I, I'll wait. We have time. So an example. Uh, suppose you have the normal, uh, 1, 1, 1, all right, and base point. 
You pick it. What do you want it to be? This is your chance. I'll do it for you. 666. Six, six. There you go. All right. So find a, a parameterization for this plane. So I left us some work to do. We need to find two vectors which are tangent to the plane. How do you do it? There's also another wrinkle here. We do need that these A and B are not the same. They're not collinear, right? They've got to be like an opposite. They can't be along a line. They've, they've, got, they've got to be genuinely independent vectors, you know? Here, I'll do one of them. You can tell me the other one. How about this? A equals to 1, 0, minus 1. Does the dot product of that in N, is it 0? Yeah, and 1 minus 1 is 0. Tell me what B should be. I did something here. It's called thinking. I'm not showing you an algorithm. I'm suggesting you can think about what you're trying to do and guess something. Yeah, negative 1, 0, 1 is the other one that's not allowed. Also, 2, 0, minus 2 is forbidden. 1, 1, 1, 1, negative 2. What a weird... Man, thank you. I was thinking... <laughs> I, I don't object to your answer. I mean, it's, it's fantastic, but I was thinking this. But yes, this is also true. I'm going to come to you to make up problems for tests. I like the way you think. That's weird. Thank you like it. We'll use his. So the parameterization then, R of ST, uh, it would be 666, six, six, oops, um, plus T times 1, 0, minus 1, plus S times 1, 1, minus 2. There you go. That's a parameterization for the plane. What's the Cartesian equation for this plane? Sometimes to mess with students, I give questions where I say, for each problem, you can either present your answer in the form of a parameterization or a uh, Cartesian equation. Your choice. When I ask you a question about a plane, what, what is the easy choice, usually? Cartesian equation, right? I mean, but it kind of depends on what your, st your starting point is. The Cartesian equation here is simply uh, da, 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 x minus um, x minus 6 plus y minus 6, plus z minus 6. And for some reason, it offends me to write it this way. I'm going to change it to x plus y plus z equals to 18. So there's the Cartesian equation of this plane. Geometrically, what's the significance of this s and t? They're essentially like coordinates on the plane, right? The s and the t are like a coordinate system on the plane itself. Right? You go so many S units this way, you go so many T units that way, and it kind of gives you a road map on the plane. Questions? Ah, I guess the next question would be, well, what's that other thing you were going to tell me about? Well, there's, I guess the, at this point we should start working problems, right? Mathematicians are only happy in as much as they have problems. That is our psychological defect. I mean, if we believed in psychology. Maybe some of you do, I don't know, whatever. See, Jeremiah 17.9 makes me wonder, is it a good idea to believe in psychology? You can look it up. All right, if you don't know it. Standard problem. I mean, this is the problem for planes. Given three points, find the equation of the plane.
This is actually very easy parametrically. I'm going to start with that. And I'm just going to do it in general. So if I have P, Q, R, are my points. So here's a picture. See, what I do is I go, OK, assuming that the P, Q, R are not collinear, if they're collinear, we've been set up. We've been set up, you know? So suppose they're not collinear, then here's the formula. And I'm going to start to write it, but you'll be able to finish it. P plus T, parentheses, plus S, parentheses. I'm going to draw a little bit more on the picture. So what I'm envisioning is this vector here being like my A. PQ vector, and I'm thinking of B as being this guy, my PR vector. <laughs> We're pretty good at that here. here. Not me personally. But. So what do I put in the parentheses? Yeah. Q minus P and R minus P. We have a winner. Yes. Q minus P and R minus P. You see how that works? If you do that, you get R of 1, 0 is equal to what? P plus Q minus P. In other words, you get Q. On the other hand, R of 0, 1 gives you P. Uh, plus r minus p, it gives you r. And of course, 0, 0 gives you p again. So this is just, this is a really nice trick to know about because there you have it, that's the parametric, parametric equations for a plane in terms of three points. It's very simple. Not knowing this formula, I've worked it out from base principles before, it's more complicated. But you know, I, I think we're clever enough in here that we've earned the right to use this formula. All right, fine. Are you guys with me? I don't, I'm not going to put numbers in because that would just cloud the issue. If I give you a specific triple of points, you could do it. Now the next one, I'm going to put numbers in, and we're going to work it out, OK? Are we good? Um, this is also nice because it actually gives you a, if you, if you limit the parameter domain, think about this, if you just limit your parameter domain to like, um, if we do 0, uh, less than or equal to s comma t, less than or equal to 1, that actually parameterizes not the whole plane, but just this parallelogram here. And that's sometimes useful because every once in a while some evil calculus 3 professor asks you questions about how to parameterize a parallelogram in a plane. This is how you just do this. So that is a parameterization of this parallelogram that has this, this point over here is what it's, I don't know what it is. I, I what? S. <laughs> it, it's, it's R of 1, 1. It's, uh, I think it, 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 it's, it's P plus Q. No, it, 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 it's Q plus R minus P, I think. Actually, that, that's that corner. If you put R of 1, 1, that's here. So 1, 1 gives me P plus Q minus P plus R minus P. But one of the P's cancel, one of them remains at that, that point. All right. This is not usually the question that, uh, that's asked of you, though, right? More typically, you're asked what I'm about to write up here. Given three points, find the Cartesian equation of the plane. <laughs>